Galatians chapter one. Wednesday, we mentioned that we started with a the thought about the world and the worlds to come, but man, we're going to continue with some thoughts here. It's an interesting study. Uh, Galatians chapter one, verse three. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. And of course, I've questioned the word present before in front of you. Present meaning undoubtedly this world, this present time. And there's been more than one, obviously, in the scriptures, but this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. Um, <clears throat> the world that's present is referred to by God as evil, okay? Now, that's the, the one we live in. Uh, our physical bodies are living in. It's called the, the tabernacle, uh, so forth and so on. But the, I do want you to turn to, to John just one time for this thought. In John chapter one, uh, three, I apologize. Now, everybody believes this is the gospel, obviously, because it's always used. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I want you to really meditate on that love. Uh, according to the writings of Paul and what we read, can read in Paul's writings, it's hard to imagine the Lord loving the world the way the world is. Now, that's not the world as the earth and the things that God created before man. That, the world, if you look at different passages, the world having to do with the people in the world, uh, the world being the worldly people. But then you got God's creation, the heaven and earth. Uh, one time he had to flood it because of the, the evilness that was on man's heart continually of, of the time of Noah. But God so loved the world. And if you get to looking about what Paul had to say about man in the eyes of the Lord and in inspiration, it's hard to imagine God loving the world. But God knows how helpless we are. We're totally and completely helpless in our salvation. And mankind coming from Adam is absolutely and completely unrighteous. Let's say it this way. Uh, Paul said there's none righteous. None that doeth good, none that is good. Uh, Jesus himself said there is none good but my Father which is in heaven. And God, we have to look at the mercy and the kindness of God this way. The mercy and the kindness of God based on the fact that God looking at man gives him a chance. God so loved the world. When he gave his son, and we know by the writings of Paul, Galatians chapter 4, when the fullness of the time has come, God sent forth his son made of a woman. And if you look back at Isaiah 7, when he asked Ahaz to ask him a sign, Ahaz would not have asked for a virgin birth. I mean, that, that was not would not have been in his uh, thinking anyway. And of course, he didn't ask a sign like God told him to. So the Lord said to the nation of Israel, well, the Lord himself should give you a sign. And the sign was the virgin birth. And, and Jesus Christ, according to, I believe it's the book of Luke with Simon, was the salvation of the Lord. He came into the world. Uh, Jesus could have saved the world, even without sacrifice, if they'd have believed who he was. And they should have known who he was. It was in the scriptures who he was. Uh, he said, search the scriptures for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they that testify me, but you will not come unto me that you, have, you might have eternal life, or you might have life. <clears throat> the prophecies and the prophets and the Psalms all foretold of the coming of the Lord and the suffering and the 
death of the Lord and the resurrection. And there was promises involved in that, the sure promises and the sure mercies of David, according to Acts chapter 2. So <clears throat> Jesus came into the world by the will of God, and he did what he did in the will of God, and he was the perfect son, the perfect sacrifice layer to be. And on all, we don't get into that right now, but I just want you to think that God loved the world because of its inability. See, salvation belongs to the Lord and his mercy and his kindness and his grace overcame, let's say it this way, God could have hated. God could have despised. But yet he set up different programs for different people to take care of them if they would let him. The whole issue is letting someone. I was talking to a man in the farmer's market yesterday. Uh, no, uh, yes, yesterday. Kathy and I was eating breakfast. And I looked at this man and I, I told Kathy, I said, I was an un, it was almost I couldn't resist going over there. He was sitting there alone and I sat down and started talking to him. And I had an Anthony dollar. I use those Anthony dollars because nobody's got those in their pocket. And when I showed him the truth of that dollar being his ticket to heaven by the, the faith of Christ and Christ dying for his sins, he began to laugh. Not a mocking laugh. It was like, wow. And he's just laughing. He just outside just laughing. And he said, I never saw that that way. He said, that was great. And I mean, you'd have never thought this, man, because he's, he's a rough looking old boy. He, he's a produce man there at the farmer's market. He brings in tomatoes and all that and strawberries. And it's just, I just couldn't resist. And I hope that somewhere down the line, it grabs him. I left him, I said, I left him a note, read 1 Corinthians 15, one through four. So maybe, just maybe something will jive in a man. And the man, look like he's about 85 he's a year younger than me he asked me how i said how old are you he said, i'm 71 how old are you i said i'm 72 he, said, he looked at me like huh and i said I'll, I'll be 73 in june uh but you know it's just he's had a rough life but a rough life don't mean you can't go to heaven a bad life don't mean you can't go to heaven a resisting not receiving the love of the truth means you can't go to heaven and so I, uh, I think about the love of God, but we'll look at this in just a minute. Now look at 1 John chapter 3. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Now, if you expect the world to be your buddy, it'll only be your buddy if you're lost. It's not going to be a buddy with the sons of God. And Paul's very clear on that in Romans 8. He said, we're counted as sheep for the slaughter. There is a God of this world that hates us. He hates anything to do with the knowledge that the church has, according to Ephesians. But now verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for he shall find, uh, shall see him, for we shall see him as he is. And the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians and 1 Corinthians 15, he said, Behold, I show you a mystery. First John is talking about, obviously, the coming of the Lord, the second coming. Paul is talking about when the Lord calls his body, the church, up. And you say, well, what will we be? Well, we're already sons of God. And we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And whatever God wants us to do or whatever God gives us or whatever the reward is, and you can read 1 Corinthians 3 and see some things about the reward. Whatever we get is because of God. 
I mean, we wouldn't even leave the earth. We'd go down in the earth if we didn't have the Lord do what he has done by faith. Jesus Christ by faith gave himself, as we began to read in Galatians chapter one, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Okay? So go to 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. He said, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Okay. Now you got the first part of it is the Lord knows you if the spirit of Christ is in you. Now watch. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In whom you also trusted at, uh, trusted in Christ. I apologize. In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit promise, which is the earnest. That is the acknowledgement. That is the knowing who you are. He said, which is the earnest of the inheritance, of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession of the praise of his glory. We know that Romans 8 tells us that redemption is adoption. Adoption is redemption. But let, let's make sure we get the order in, in correct. Romans 8, verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, that's the Spirit of the dear Son, we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. You will not be redeemed unless you're adopted. You won't be adopted unless you have the spirit of adoption, which is in Romans 8. And you won't have the spirit of adoption unless you hear the gospel of your salvation and trust it. And when you believe that, when you believe it, you're sealed with that Holy Spirit promise. And that Holy Spirit promise is back in Galatians chapter 3. Look in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ had redeemed us, the Israelites, the Jews, from the curse of the law, because they were under the law, being made a curse for us. That's the tree. For it is written, cursed everyone who hangeth on a tree. But the tree is not ours. The cross is. The knowledge of the cross is that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture and was buried and rose again the third day according to Scripture. Paul's message is the cross. Peter's message is the tree, okay? The tree is what killed the Lord, and the Israelites put him on that. The message of understanding of the tree, Paul gives for, cursed everyone that hangeth on a tree. That's why uh, it was such a thing for them to have that plaque above Jesus' head on that tree, king of the Jews, because they know that a tree is cursedness. Cursed everyone that hangeth on a tree. So the message that Peter is preaching in Acts 2 is a repentant, changing their mind and believing that Jesus, who was on that tree, who they believed to be cursed, was raised from the dead by the Father, and he is truly the Son of God. Paul's message about the knowledge of the tree was, he was taking Israel out from under the curse on the tree. Now watch, verse 13, Christ had redeemed us from the curse law, being made a curse for us, for it's written, curses, everyone that hangeth on a tree. That, and the key is that, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith, okay? Genesis 12, in Genesis 12, Now, the preaching is always blessing Israel, but that's not all that's in Genesis 12. Genesis 12, 1, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. That's the promise, okay? I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. Now, you understand Deuteronomy 6, uh, Deuteronomy 11 says, I'll lay before you this day a blessing and a curse. I'll bless you if you do everything I tell you, a curse if you don't. They didn't, and so they were under a curse. 
Jesus Christ became a curse for Israel, hanging on a tree that he might bring them out from under the curse by being resurrected, okay? Now, but watch, verse three, I'll bless them that bless thee and curse him that curses thee. The devil understands this. And if he can do away with any promises about Israel and Gentiles being associated with them, he thinks he's got something licked. Now watch, colon, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Turn to Romans 16. I know this is, we got to just lay this out in Romans 16. All right, Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, <clears throat> but now is made manifest and by the scripture. Now you understand comma and by the scripture. That's first Corinthians 15, three and four. Christ died for our sins according to scripture and was buried and rose again the third day according to scripture. That is Paul's gospel. Okay. My gospel of verse uh, 25. Okay. But now is made manifest. The manifestation is that it's being made known what hanging on that tree did for us. Remember, Genesis says, colon, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Okay? Those people that the tree took Israel out from under the cross, if they want it, if they want to repent, if they want to be baptized and separated from the old nation, if they want to be identified with the old nation, and on and on then they, they're, they come out from under the curse. If not, they're still uh, under a curse, you might say. I don't know how to say it. Um, if, if they will not do what Peter says, they'll be damned. I guess that's the best word I know how to use. Uh, Mark 16, hold on to that where we're at. In Mark 16, Look with me in verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That present world, by the way. He that believeth and is baptized should be saved, but he that believeth not should be damned. Okay? So if a person won't believe the gospel that the apostles are preaching, Acts 2, 3, 4, then they will be damned. Okay? Look in 2 Thessalonians. In 2 Thessalonians, what did Paul preach? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of power, Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, with all the seemless of unrighteous, them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. It has nothing to do with walking, asking, joining, uh, turning, prayer it says them uh because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved there's a truth out there that is your salvation if you receive it yesterday that guy i was holding that dollar out and i said uh, what are you going to do with this and he he hesitated he didn't want to take it finally he took it I said, what makes it yours? And he said, it's not mine. I said, yes, it is. He said, what makes it mine? I said, that's what I'm asking you. What makes it yours? And he didn't know. And I said, because you receive it. And that's when he started laughing and just joyous. He said, oh my gosh, I never saw just receiving what Jesus did. I said, I know people don't because that's the message of Paul, receiving what's already done. That's all it is. It's just, it's so simple. People miss it. Christ died for our sins. Well, then we're not going to die for our sins. But very simple. Then if you're not going to die for your sins, then you're not going to die. He was buried and he rose again the third day. And this is in accordance with the scripture. So it's not something that Paul decided to make up like these TV evangelists are doing right now. 
making up things that they need this and they need that. And they got to have this and they got to have that. All I need in life is to have my heavenly father have his love upon me. And his love is upon me in Romans chapter eight because I'm an adopted son. And I can't be an adopted son unless he makes that provision for me. And he did. And he stated it in Romans chapter eight, Ephesians chapter one. It became, we came adopted because the spirit of the dear son was offered to us while the nation of Israel was offered repentance and remission we were offered the spirit of his dear son for redemption, which is adoption and forgiveness, justification, righteousness, the whole thing, the completeness in Colossians chapter two. So in verse 10, with all deceitfulness of unrighteousness and them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause shall God shall send them strong delusion that you should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. And it didn't say who believe not. It said believed not. It said received not in verse 10. I wrote a big time teacher of grace for many years. He's been dead now, but they, his the article in his uh, bulletin that he sent out once every two or three months. And they said that people get a second chance in the tribulation. Not if they've heard the truth. If they're in the tribulation, they've heard the truth, they didn't receive it. And you have the ED on there. So I asked myself, what's the ED? Because they took the ED off of verse nine, uh, 10, uh, and they took the word received, not they said it's received. They took the ED off and made it because they had in some way, I don't know how they said it, but there was no way they received. And I go, what are you, why are you confused in this matter? I mean, it's confusing trying to say it. Received not. I said, what's the ED on there? What does ED mean on that word? There was a time when they could receive it. So they're saying, well, they can receive it in the tribulation. No, they can't. They cannot. Why? It says, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. If you turn on Zoom or you go to a Bible study and somebody preaches to you the gospel of Christ, you're held accountable for that for eternity. If you don't receive it, then a time come when you receive not. And that time come and receive not, you're damned, you're doomed, you're in, you're in, you're in a horrible position because you were going to death. And you understand people don't get it right. They need to get it right. This body will die one way or another. If we go out alive, it'll be changed. If we do not make it to the going out alive, we give up this body, which is death. It's, it's death. Romans 7, very clear on this. And Romans 6 is so clear as he goes through that, that the body of sin might be destroyed. God doesn't care if you lose your body, if you're saved. He identified you with the spirit of his dear son so that the Lord knoweth them that are his. Now go back to uh, Romans 16, verse 26. But now, the, the, the glorious words of Paul, but now, now, but now, but now is made manifest and, comma, and by the scriptures of the prophets, According to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for obedience of the faith, for the obedience of faith, to obey the faith. The faith gave himself that he might deliver us. His love was so great for the Father. And that love of Christ was our blessing. The love of God was for his Son. And he accepted the love of God, of the son, in what he did. Now, go to Romans 8. And remember, 2 Timothy said, he knoweth them that are his. They're bought with a price. 
Romans 8, 8, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, it's, you, you know, you, you hard to show people that they're not in the flesh because they are thinking fleshly way. They're, they're thinking the natural man. And they'll look at you and say, what are you talking about in the flesh? Of course we're in the flesh. But you're not. That, that's the glorious thing about Galatians 2, 20. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. The yet not I means that God doesn't see my flesh. The glorious thing about not being in the flesh, but in the spirit, verse 9, but you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be the spirit of God dwell in you. And now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The spirit of Christ has to be in you for God to know you. The spirit of Christ will not come in you unless you hear the gospel of your salvation and you trust it. That matches Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How shall they call on him and whom they not believe? And how shall they believe in him and whom they not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings to good things. God chose men that were willing to go by their feet and preach the gospel of peace. Not the gospel of condemnation. You ever think about what is the gospel of condemnation? Let's well, Acts chapter 2. The gospel of condemnation. If I go on the fact that I repent and get baptized, I join the church, I ask Jesus in my heart, say the sinner's prayer, turn from my sins, rededicate, those kind of things. That's a gospel of condemnation. God will condemn you because you didn't receive the love of the truth. Somebody said, well, what if you didn't hear the love of the truth? Then you're going to take your chance on going through the tribulation, or you're going to take your chance of going to the great white throne and seeing if your works will make it possible for you to go into the book of life. Now, that is something I wouldn't want to trust. I would not want to be relying on what I did to make the judgment. I want to be at a judgment where it's already been settled that I'm his. And that's the judgment seat of Christ. And it's because somebody preached the gospel to me. I heard it and I received it. I obeyed the faith, obedience of the faith. Okay. Now, <clears throat> according to verse nine, you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Now, if you're not in the flesh, then you not, being not in the flesh, you've allowed your old man to be crucified. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I mean, you can't deny we're living in the flesh, living like alive. I mean, Paul was alive when he penned it, but he said, we're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. God in his miraculous salvation plan for us, the body of Christ, he crucified us in his son. Being crucified in his son, we were buried and raised. He sees us in Christ. Seeing us in Christ, we're holy and without blame. Ephesians 1, 3, and 4. Seeing us that way, we are his sons and daughters and children of God, however you want to say it. And when I say sons of God, I'm not trying to leave the women out. We're sons of God because obviously in the resurrection or in the other world, which we're going to get to, neither marriage or given in marriage, like the angels. So what you have here, enjoy because you're going to be totally different up there. This is a world of population. God gave a man, a woman, for population, a right to love, be satisfied with, have children. 
That was part of the world, the present world that we live in. According to Romans chapter 5, verse 12, wherefore as by one man, Adam, sin entered the world. How did it enter? Children. All children are sinners. Nature of sin, inheritance, nature of sin, nature is death. Sin entered the world. God loved that world. He made it. He made Adam. He made Eve. He allowed children. He allowed them to live after they've eaten. They lived hundreds of years after they've eaten. They didn't die right then in the sense of physical. They died somewhere because of sin, disobedience. Their disobedience caused them to die somewhere. And that's what the devil was working for. And you realize that somewhere in people's lives, they're going to die because of sin. And all they have to do is receive the love of the truth while it's being offered. Turn to 2 Corinthians 6. 2 Corinthians 6, 1. We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the, love, the grace of God in vain. The, the grace of God is being offered. Receive not the grace of God in vain. You were born in grace. You're living in grace. You have a chance to have that grace save you. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not yourself, get to God, not a work, lest any man should boast. As you walk your life, you're in God's grace. You can receive it right now. Or you receive not in vain. Now, if you receive not in vain, the Lord says it's time and his body leaves. Then the time you go into, you will be damned. Now, to me, one of the most horrible thoughts, and I've meditated on a lot, is going into a tribulation and then forever simply because of pride. Because someone came to you and said, did you know the good news? What is it? Christ died for our sins, according to scripture, and was buried and rose again the third day. And that's God's way of saving us. And if you'll trust it, God will seal you forever. You'll become his son adopted, heir of God, joint heir with Christ, holy and without blame, and it'll have nothing to do with whether you tote the line, whether you keep things the way they ought to be, act good, has nothing to do with that. Go to church, nothing. It's already done. And you look at them and say, no, nah, it can't be that way. And you later on was to go into the tribulation and remember that. I always think about Peter. The Lord said, you know, before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. And Peter, he didn't believe that for a minute. No, no, I'll never deny you. And come to think about it later on, he did. And I can't help but think about the Lord looking at him after he denied him the third time, turning, and the Bible very clearly turned and looked at him, and I thought, what a look of horror that is. And Paul says in the Corinthian letter, I believe it is, uh, let me see if I can find the one I, I want. Hang on just a second. <clears throat> Might be 1 Corinthians 3. Or I'm missing one I want, Romans 14. Hang on, give me just a break here. Well, I'm not seeing it. Second Corinthians chapter five. Anyway, the verse says, knowing the terror. Oh, oh, uh, Second Corinthians 5, 11. Know therefore the terror of the Lord. 
There's a day when we're going to actually stand before God. If we're saved, we're going to stand before God and the Son at the judgment seat of Christ. If we're lost, we'll stand before the great white throne. But either way, it's God looking at you and asking you. I remember when, you know, when you're a boy, you have to go to the principal's office. It was a terror to have the principal ask you, why are you here? I think about at the great white throne, what God asked a person, why are you here? I gave you a chance to be with me. Depart from me. I never knew you, you work of iniquity, into the lake of fire. If you could convince everybody in this world of that, would they accept it? Doesn't appear so. You know, they asked the Lord, Lord, as an evil adulterous generation asked him a sign. The Lord, we, we would you have given us a sign. He said, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but there'll be no sign given to it except as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. So shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. <clears throat> the Lord came out and they didn't want to believe that witness. Why well, our apostle didn't want to believe that witness. And the witness was given by Peter and them. We've been with him for 40 days. He's raised from the dead. And all the Jews that wouldn't repent are saying, no. And Saul of Tarsus, no. And he's ready to kill the apostles. He's ready to deny Stephen. And it's only the only way that Saul will ever be converted is have the Lord himself appear to him. And in that appearing, Lord, what do you have me do? He didn't know who he was. He said, Lord, who are you? And then when Jesus said, I'm Jesus, and thou persecutest hard for thee to kick against bricks, Lord, what do you have me do? He had no idea what his life was going to do and change right there, buddy. I mean, there's no way of understanding what Paul was thinking at that moment when he was told, you go into the city, and he'd be told then when he got to the city blind, Ananias told him some things, and, oh, my, things are changing for this man. Well, you know what? <clears throat> Do you realize that when you're lost, and if you're lost right now, I don't know. That's between you and the Lord. That your life is different than when the Lord preaches the gospel to you through a preacher and you trust it. Your life changes completely. And somebody says, what do you mean it changed? I'm not talking about you losing your sinful desires and your nature. No, no. Your life changes because all of a sudden you're accounted as a sheep for the slaughter. Now, the whole world dies because of sin. I realize that. But all of a sudden you become accounted as a sheep for the slaughter because now you're an heir of God and joint heir of Christ, and you are hated more than you could ever imagine by Satan because you have a truth in you, a treasure. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God, not of us. And listen, man, one more time. Go to 1 John 3, where we read this. 1 John chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not then don't expect this present evil world to love you. Don't expect the devils that are around, the angelics, to love you. What you have is something greater. Look at Philippians. I'll get three verses. And if I don't, I'll have to be have help. Remember Philippians and 1 Corinthians 15. Philippians chapter uh, uh, let's see the verse I want. Philippians 4 all right, Philippians 4, 4, 13. Now, let's go back. 
Verse 10, Philippians 4, 4 uh, 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you also were careful. Uh, you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatever state I am therewith be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer. Nay, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Now, I doubt the evangelists today are suffering from need of their wants. I mean, the world, this present day world, is supplying their need very much. Uh, Rodney was talking about Copeland. The man has two airplanes. He has airport by his house. The man flies anywhere he wants. I mean, you do not get in your own private jet for about $50 of gas like you do in your car. I mean, it's probably $10,000 in fuel. And you got to have a pilot on call 24 hours a day. He's got a tremendous salary. All in all, <clears throat> that's just a drop in a bucket. It don't mean nothing. You got a year, a yearly maintenance on the airplanes. You got a hangar. You got a, you got lights and air conditioning. And everything has to be so so. Money's not an object. When you're the richest evangelist in the world, you don't worry about the monetary side. Well. Our apostle was the greatest pastor, teacher, apostle to me there is. And he had to learn how to abase and how to abound. But he knew that he could do all things through Christ, which strengthened him. Well, watch 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Our Lord is raised. He died and he rose. The strength of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we, uh, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Did the Lord Jesus Christ on earth labor? Yes, he did. He did the will of the Father. Now, you're the walking will of the Father. You, if you've obeyed the truth, you're the walking will of the Father. And <clears throat> as you walk as a member of the body of Christ, you're counted as sheep for the slaughter, Romans 8. You're an enemy of the devil, no doubt. And everything that you learn or speak of in what you learned, he hears. And he wants to shut your mouth any possible way that he can. He wants to shut your mouth. And yet Paul said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. He goes over to 1 Timothy. Now look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse 3, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to Godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof Come with envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputing of men, a corrupt mind, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. The bigger the ministry, the more godly it is, they believe. Well, let's see what it says. Uh, supposing that gain is God from such withdraw thyself, but godliness with contentment is great gain. I, uh, I think about it sometimes. I don't understand how I can be happy. And I'm not a bubbly type happy person like Kathy is, but I'm happy. And it's hard to understand how I can be happy. I don't own a house. I don't own anything. And it doesn't bother me a bit. I got a place to live. I got places to teach. I got people that will actually let me in their place and let me teach to them and teach for them. Uh, I have cars to drive. I have money to buy gas. Why, why would I be unhappy? Well, I'm unhappy because of Romans 8. Go back to Romans 8 and watch. Verse 23. And not only that, well, let's go back to verse 21. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. 
For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. What do you groan in? In yourself. What are you groaning about? For the Lord to bring us up. The Lord to bring his children up, get them away from this present day world. And is that not what Jesus gave himself? Turn back to Galatians chapter one. Verse three, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and the Father, our Father. That will was not known by the devil. The will of God, Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? His Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The will of God was for Jesus to commend his spirit unto him because he is going to die. Why, in the garden, he said, uh, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And in Galatians chapter 4, he, he said, when the fullness of time has come, God sent forth his son made of a woman. That's to die. He's not an angel. Made of a woman. Made under the law. Under the law, he'll take the curse away. Made of a woman, he's the man. Look at First Timothy chapter uh, 2, verse 4, who will have all men, that's God our Savior, verse 3, Paul God, who will have all men to be saved come to the knowledge of the truth. He would have all men. God would not stop any human from being saved if they wanted to be. But he knows who they are. And bless your soul, God has it in mind that some would hear and be damned some will go into the tribulation not here and try to survive the tribulation, help the Jews, so forth and so on. I leave that all up to God. God's got it all worked out the way he wants to. As like I told you, that guy almost was, it was almost irresistible to me to not go over and talk to him, and I did. Don't ever let that almost non-resistible talk to him. If you have that feeling, you ought to talk to them. Talk to them. It'll be a blessing to you. And if they're there with the Father and you, they'll be your joy and crown. That's in the Thessalonians letter. So he he's saying uh, God would he'd have all men to be saved. But for all men to be saved. Somebody has to give it herself a ransom for all. Okay. Now you list verse five. Well, there's one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. The ransom's paid. God took that problem out of the way. Revelation 20, the judgment is not about sins. It is about their works. You don't want any part of that. You don't want to have any chance of going to that. You want to trust God's salvation for you right now. Uh, one other thing before I go on, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, again. Verse 1, we then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Parentheses, for he saith, I've heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation of our succor day, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now this day might be your salvation, but the day is the day of grace. The dispensation of grace is our day to be saved. It came through the but now of Paul. So we have no excuse if the Lord presents it to us. No excuse whatsoever. Christ died for our sins, according to Scripture, and was buried and rose again the third day, according to Scripture. Brother Moore and I was standing in the studio one day, and I don't know we were fixing to do something, and I said, Brother Moore, did you ever think about if you preach to people that you're either 
condemning them or they're going to get saved. And he said, I thought about it many times. And he said, it's not up to us. It's up to the father. The calling of God. God knows who to call. Uh, Romans 11 says at that time, and, and uh, Elijah, is, he's complaining. It's not getting any activity. It's not working out the way he thought it was. And, and look what in Romans 11. Um, verse 2, God did not cast away his people which he foreknew. And that, that's the, the reference is about Paul going to the Jew first, the elect Jews according to grace. Okay, but let's read this. Uh, God not cast away his people which you foreknew. For ought you not what the scriptures say of Elias, how that he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, they're not doing what he wants them to do. The former preacher here at Selman, I've been here 25, 26 years. I don't know, I can't even remember. The former pastor here tried to change the church. And I told him, I said, you're out of luck. You're not going to change people. They're going to do whatever they want to do. People go and do and act and talk the way they want to. Well, they put up on front maybe for a little while, but you can't change people. And he'd been watching some TV evangelist and was talking about love and, and talking about the things that people need to do and all that. Dream on. People will do whatever they want to do. God can move you to do what he wants to do. But even that, you've got a choice. That's why I say, if something's irresistible to you, do it, and your reward is involved in that. But you can fight it. I guarantee you can fight it. And people do. But he says, he maketh intercession. See, that intercession is that argument of God. God, you sent me out here, and they're not doing what you're telling them. They're not working it out. It's not working out, Lord. Verse 3. Lord, they've killed thy prophets and dig down on orders, and I'm left alone. They seek my life. They're, oh, now, see, it's getting personal. I'm in trouble, Lord. You sent me out here, and you're letting me die. Doesn't that sound like the Israelites in Egypt coming out into the wilderness? You brought us out here to kill us. Why would he do that? He'd kill them in Egypt if he wanted to. He'd kill you anywhere he wants. You brought us out, now we're dying, we're thirsting, and we're hungry, and blah, blah, blah. Just groaning and moaning. The Lord said, do all things without murmuring and disputing. Wouldn't that be a good idea? Wouldn't that be a good idea to follow that, that commandment, you might say, of, of the Lord through Paul? Do all things without murmuring and disputing. Can you be happy with what you have? If you receive something that you didn't have, then why can't you be happy with that? Because you didn't have it in the first place. You know, one man's junk's another man's treasure. I mean, you go, why would you go to a flea market and buy you stuff? Because it's new to you. We'll be happy. If you got no money and all of a sudden you got money, be happy. You didn't have it before. If you got no car and now you got one, be happy. You didn't have one before. I always look at it that way. God is able to give and receive, or he can take away. But now, he said, the Lord, Lord, they killed, thy, this is the intercession. Lord, they killed thy prophets and dig down the north, and I'm left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. I sent you for this, and if it was in the scripture, it would be shut up. I sent you out there. I know exactly what I'm doing, and I know where I'm sending you. Well, think about that in your life. God in this present evil world knows how to take care of you. He took care of you in salvation. He will take care of you in life. Trust is in the salvation and trust is in living. Philippians chapter 4. Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Your moderation is yielding to the ability of God to do what he's going to do. Verse 4, 3, 5. 
Let your Maharaj be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. How so many times have I drawn off that verse because things were not right and things, sometimes I wasn't feeling good. Things were not right. I believe that God is a healer. I believe he's the great physician. And the reason I believe that is he made man out of dirt. And he made a man that could live 969 years. And I believe that God, by the book itself, can do whatever he wants. And I believe that prayer is one of the great things in relationship with God. When I lay down at night, my great, greatest thing in my life almost at this time and point in my life is to be able to pray to God and a peace comes over me, I go to sleep. Uh, when you get older, sleep is not as good. But when you trust the Lord, and I ask the Lord, I say, sustain me tonight, if it's thy will, and wake me up in the morning. Because there's nothing else. There's no other God I would trust to do that. There's no image that I would look at or hold on to. But it's a great peace knowing that my father, my heavenly father, is my father. I'm adopted. And he loves me. But he lets suffering, he lets things come in your life that you learn that it'd be greater to be with him. Paul said it'd be far greater to be with the Lord. But he's here for purpose. So if we're here on the earth, we have a purpose. If we're in this present evil world with a treasure in an earthen vessel, which is vile, the excellency of the power may be of God. And we're the walking witness that God has that ability. We're, we moderate, our moderation is God has the ability to take care. And if he don't, he ain't worth the worship. If he don't have the ability, he ain't worth opening the book for. If he ain't, well, I believe that book came from God by inspiration. But I do. And I'll bet my life and eternal life on it that God can't lie people that don't want to believe that that's fine and if they don't want to believe that if it is true and I believe it is then they're going to be damned and you don't want damnation from God you want to be delivered from this present evil world and the promise of God is there's a day of redemption coming the promise of God is you have redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. Why did they mess with Colossians chapter 1, verse 14, if there isn't the truth there that the devil don't want you to see? He don't want you to see that in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. He don't want you to see that. He wants to change it to where you don't have the blood. And without the blood, you don't have the sacrifice. And without the sacrifice, you're not accepted in the beloved. We are accepted in the blood. Today is the day of salvation. If you're listening to me and you have some problems, or you not have security in what I just said, you better think about this. Salvation belongs unto the Lord. That's Psalm chapter three, verse eight, I believe. And I don't want to misquote it to you. Uh, I believe it's Psalm. Make sure I get the right verse to you. Psalm 3, verse 8, salvation belongeth unto the Lord. There's more than one verse on that, by the way. Um, salvation belongs to him. He knew how to save you. He knew what it take because he's righteous. And righteousness has to be the way the world is with God. We live in an evil world where there is none righteous, but God loved the world. And he let his son become sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus gave himself that he might deliver us from this present evil world. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he literally died for our sins. He was buried. He went down into hell for three days. And on the third day, resurrection of jesus christ 
we were raised with him and seated at the right hand of the Father in him. He is our representation. He's our mediation. He is our intercessor when we pray. God doesn't hear our evil prayers or off-center prayers or not knowing what we should pray for. That doesn't bother God because Jesus makes intercession for us. When God wants to see us, he wants to see God's son in him, in us. I mean, he don't see us. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. God don't see us. He sees his son. And if you don't think that don't make him happy, you're wrong. To see his son in you makes God very happy because you obeyed the faith. You received the love of the truth that you might be saved. And for that, with all said and done, let Jesus deliver you from this present evil world. Let him be your savior. Let him and his faith be enough to satisfy God. Amen. Amen. Amen Wonderful. Amen. Amen. That was beautiful. Yeah. Praise the Lord. We ain't done with this, by the way. I ain't done with this at all. Well, good. Uh, the world is an amazing study. <laughs>